Texas then moved to a secret location, perhaps in Kalamazoo, Michigan, the Midwest, or Hawaii. Presley has maintained a low profile ever since, but has been tape recorded at least twice, once in a late night phone call to Gail Brewer Giorgio. Well, maybe you'll be a grandfather. Elvis Presley was also allegedly recorded in a longer conversation with a woman named Ellen Foster in 1981. I started traveling all over the world, and it's been, uh, it's been enjoyable, but it's, it's been a constant battle of uh, growing beards and, and this and that to, to keep from being recognized. Some believe and hope that Elvis Presley will soon come out of hiding and explain to the world the real circumstances of his disappearance. All right. As with many conspiracy theories, proof for the Elvis conspiracy is very elusive. We know for a fact that Elvis Presley had received a DEA, uh, uh, received a DEA appointment as a special assistant to the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs by President Richard M. Nixon and was given a badge. We also know that he had unknowingly become a victim of an organized crime conspiracy to defraud him of a large sum of money and that the criminal group known as the Fraternity became the target of an FBI sting operation in part because of this conspiracy. And as we all know, for the last few years, there have been a number of Elvis sightings all around the country. Now, after the airing of our first special, we were swamped by people with their own sighting stories to tell. We were skeptical, but we did check them out. And most all of the sightings fell apart under scrutiny. But in a few cases, we couldn't ignore what these witnesses had to say. So throughout the course of this broadcast, we're going to bring you their stories in their own words so that you can decide for yourself. For example, Is Elvis Presley alive? Our first sighting took place in August of 1991 in Clyde, Ohio. My name is Kelly Wadsworth. On August 23rd of 1991, I saw Elvis Presley at Winesburg Inn in Clyde, Ohio. When we heard Kelly's statement, we sent investigators to Clyde, Ohio, and the location of the sighting, the Winesburg Inn. Kelly Wadsworth is certain that Elvis Presley had dinner there, and she believes that she has the photographs to prove it. On the night of August 23, 1991, at approximately 6 p.m., Kelly and her boyfriend observed a man fitting Elvis's description, exiting a car that was suspiciously parked in the back of the restaurant. And I said, God, this guy really looks like him. I said, we've got to go home and get the camera and take some pictures. Nobody's going to believe me. A few minutes later, Kelly returned with the camera. I checked in the lobby. Nobody was there. I looked in the bar side, nobody was there, and then that's when I spotted him. He was sitting in the restaurant. When I took my first picture and the click went off, I shocked him off. The bodyguard ran towards me and then he ran around the side and grabbed the stuff from the table. And then they started running out to the back door. I thought, maybe I can get a couple more good shots. What is very strange to me is if this wasn't Elvis, then why was he getting up in a hurry after I took a picture? In fact, the bodyguard even came towards me to keep me from taking another shot. I never dreamed this was going to happen. At the restaurant, we talked with hostess Chris Davidson about Kelly's sighting. Chris remembered the incident and described the mysterious man. He is dark, real dark, black, who was this man? We do know that he made a reservation under the name of John Burroughs. Besides that, his identity and whereabouts today is unknown.
Could Elvis still be alive? Call 1-900-740-0410 from a touchtone phone anytime during our broadcast and give your opinion. Our poll will be updated during the course of our broadcast and selected callers will be able to ask questions of our panel. Calls are $2 per minute and callers under 18 need parental permission before calling. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, we'll follow a mysterious paper trail that may lead straight to Elvis Presley. That's me. Me again. Bullseye. Guess you could say I'm a magnet for stains. And each one meant money down the drain. Until I discovered new Ultra Dash. New Ultra Dash packs an extra stain-fighting ingredient that can power out some of the toughest stains. But it doesn't cost a fortune. Maybe I ought to tell them about Dash. New Ultra Dash. It cleans a mess for less. I'll borrow my mother's earrings, her scarf, but my mother's tampons. No way! I found new Ultimates cardboard applicator tampons from Playtex. Great protection, plus a curved cardboard applicator. Ultimates. It's not your mother's tampon. Shower yourself with a new sensation. New refreshing shield. Feel the blast. The high-energy beat of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s unique skin-vigorating formula. Refreshment that'll turn you around. New refreshing S.H.I.E.L.D. How can you stop a throbbing toothache? Massage your hand with ice. How do you cure poison ivy? Try oatmeal. How do I know these cures really work? Because my staff and I interviewed over 500 top U.S. doctors for this incredible book. The Doctor's Book of Home Remedies from the editors of Prevention Magazine Health Books. I'm Bill Gottlieb, Editor-in-Chief. And I can assure you there has never been a more complete encyclopedia of home healing techniques. Over 670 pages, 2,300 remedies. From controlling diabetes to ending diaper rash, it's all right in here. Call now for the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. Try it absolutely free for 21 days. Then, if you choose to keep it, pay in three easy installments of only $8.98. Plus, you'll get this Meals That Heal cookbook free. Remember, you can try the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies free for 21 days. So call now. Call 1-800-992-2100. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. A few minutes ago, we brought you the story of Kelly Wadsworth, an Ohio woman who believes that she may have seen Elvis. Last August, no matter what you believe, there was one part of Kelly's story that intrigued us, and that is this. Now, during the course of researching this broadcast, we've come across this name many times. Our next guest will share with us the results of his investigation, which makes the name John Burroughs a name to be reckoned with. Joining us is Monty Nicholson, an investigator for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and the author of two books, The Presley Arrangement and Elvis Calling. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Monty Nicholson. All right, now, uh, Monty, your investigation into the controversy regarding Elvis Presley's death began as a novel, didn't it? Yeah, Bill, it really did. It was my intention from the very beginning to write novels, fiction novels, that would immortalize Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Of course, as I researched that information, I got caught up in this controversy. Yeah. But you know, I think the most interesting thing I've seen of everything is this paper trail of John Burroughs. All right, let's share some of that investigation now. A week or two after the Elvis Files aired, I received a call from a gentleman with an amazing story to tell. This man was something of a computer hacker. Intrigued by our show, he tried to track down Elvis Presley's credit report. He typed in the name and found nothing. He tried again, only this time, he typed in Elvis's social security number. Bingo! Up came some information, and next to Elvis's number was a second number. When he typed in that number, up came the name Elvis Presley. Curiously, another name also appeared, John Burroughs. John Burroughs' name was woven together with Elvis Presley's throughout this lengthy credit report. This was just the beginning. Well, it appears that Elvis Presley, or someone using that name, has a very active credit history. Since 1977, 
when he supposedly died. Now, usually when a person dies, their credit history is wiped out after seven years. Isn't that correct? That's Mike? correct. It appears that someone is actively using Elvis Presley's credit history as late as March of 1991. Now, what do you mean by using? Well, someone appears to be taking Elvis Presley's Social Security number or yeah. the number that's uh, assigned to John Burroughs mm -hmm. and is using them in a series of financial transactions. Now, our information doesn't explain what kind of transactions these are, but the fact that somebody's using them is pretty curious and maybe criminal. All right, then where does John Burroughs fit in? Well, it's highly unlikely that John Burroughs and Elvis Presley's credit history could overlap if they're two distinct individuals. Mm -hmm. This John Burroughs uh, may be in violation of the law unless, of course, he is Elvis Presley. Now, take a look at this. Our paper trail begins with an entry that shows John Burroughs living in Fort Worth, Texas in December of 1989. It then leads to Kalamazoo, Michigan, where John Burroughs had another residence. This paper trail also revealed that John Burroughs had applied for credit in Little Rock, Arkansas, Birmingham, Alabama, Shreveport, Louisiana, and Kansas City, Missouri. Continuing along this trail, we uncovered a new address for John Burroughs in Perrysburg, Ohio, and most recently in Chicago, Illinois. But the curious thing about this paper trail is that it begins in Memphis, Tennessee. Monty, where in Memphis? One of the addresses was Graceland. So you're telling us that John Burroughs lives at Graceland? That's what the file appeared to show. One of the former addresses was Graceland, yes. All right, what explanation do you have for this? Well, I believe there's three theories. One, Elvis Presley's alive. Two, uh, someone's concocted this entire thing in order to keep the rumor afloat. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, this thing's all a smokescreen to lead us to believe we've solved the mystery and throw us off the trail. Uh, sometime late December, mm -hmm. uh, I went on the road with another investigator uh, trying to track down uh, this elusive John Burroughs and follow up on some of the uh, more credible Elvis sightings. Uh, why don't we just go ahead and run that? now and, I'll, and it'll explain. All right. Recently, a man named David Wasson got a letter written by a John Burroughs postmark in Fort Worth, Texas. It had a return address, so that's where we started. Now, this paper trail led us to this rather obscure area in Texas. Now, we haven't gone to the house yet. That will be our next step. Understand that you are watching this as it happens. We don't know what to expect, but you will be there with us. What you've been looking at is a house that a person by the name of John Burroughs lives. I'm pretty skeptical at this point looking at the neighborhood, but one of two things is going to happen. Either a man simply by the name of John Burroughs lives at this address, or the king has been here in hiding since 1977. You watch it and go with me now as we contact the people that live there and see what they can tell us about John Burroughs. When we went to the house, it was empty, but we met a woman who spoke to us on the condition that we not show her face. She told us some intriguing things about John Burroughs. John is a businessman? Yeah. I thought you said he was an entertainer. Well, he is, but I mean, he's got a lot of industry. Something I don't know. He's got a business Well, now let me ask you this question. You're aware of the controversy yeah. that that Elvis may still be alive. Yeah. How do you feel about John Burroughs? Do you think there's a possibility that he could be the king in hiding? No, no, uh... Well, I don't know. I don't know. Or you don't want to talk about it? I can't. I can't. You can't talk about it. What's he look like? He does look like Elvis, huh? How old, how old a man is he, would you say? Uh, I don't know. He's John Burroughs, from what you told me, you don't have any pictures of him. He, as soon as he found that someone was looking into his identity, he moved. Uh, by your statements, he's in hiding. That he doesn't want to be found, he doesn't want to be interviewed. And really, basically, you're saying that there's not a lot that you can talk about. The last thing the woman told us was that Burroughs had recently moved to Perrysburg, Ohio. The lady I talked to was very hesitant about talking to me about John Burroughs. She says he's a man that uh, wants to be in hiding. 
he's a man that does not want to be known as Elvis Presley. I ask why John Burroughs will not return my phone calls, will not allow me to interview him. If he indeed is not Elvis Presley, that would certainly dispel the rumor. All right, Monty, where did John Burroughs move? The woman told us that he'd moved to Perrysburg, Ohio, several months before we arrived. Coincidentally, that's in an area where a number of the so-called Elvis sightings have occurred. All right, where does this paper trail finally end up? Well, the most recent address is Chicago, Illinois. We ran an address update uh, from the existing paper trail, and that report came back with an additional name and new address. The address was in Chicago, and the name, curiously, was Presley. Well, when we return, we're going to explore the origins of the mysterious Mr. John Burroughs and try to give him a personal call. So stay with us. Is Elvis Presley alive? Our second sighting took place in late December 1989 in Grand Blanc, Michigan. It was the holiday season, and a celebration was in full swing. To a woman we will call Cindy, it was a Christmas she would never forget. Near the end of her shift, working at a local bar, Cindy was saying goodnight to some regular customers when she noticed a man sitting alone. There was something about him that seemed somehow familiar. Intrigued, she tried to engage him in conversation. Cindy said that though the light concealed the man's face, she became more and more certain she had seen him before. Somehow the conversation turned to entertainment, and the man told Cindy that one of his best friends was singer Tom Jones. Somewhat skeptical, Cindy finally finished up her conversation and went to turn on a bar light. Then she realized who the man was, but it was too late. For by the time she looked back, the man was gone. Later, two men reported seeing the man entering a stretch limo outside. Cindy is convinced the man was Elvis Presley. Could Elvis still be alive? Call 1-900-740-0410 from a touchtone phone anytime during our broadcast and give your opinion. Our poll will be updated during the course of our broadcast and selected callers will be able to ask questions of our panel. Calls are $2 per minute and callers under 18 need parental permission before calling. When we come back, we'll probe the identity of the mysterious John Burroughs, a name that brought Elvis Presley to the... Of all the important safety features we put in the new Camry, some may seem a bit extravagant. Stronger body construction, child protector rear door locks, rear seat headrests, adjustable front seat belt anchors, standard driver side airbag, available anti-lock brake. But when it came to safety, we didn't ask what it costs. We asked what it could save. The all-new 1992 Toyota Camry. We just couldn't leave well enough alone. Taco Bell salutes California's Olympic hopefuls. Santa Cruz's Eva Twardokins continues to train for a chance in Maribel, site of the women's Olympic events. A team leader, Eva is quietly confident about the games. Just a really special event and just representing my country um, in a way that would make me proud and I'll, I'd really like to be there. Eva Twardokins, a California Olympic hopeful. This Albertville update has been brought to you by Taco Bell. If you try Taco Bell's you breakfast burrito, it's good. Mmm, more scrambled eggs like mama makes with cheddar cheese and sausage or bacon. Mmm. Taco Bell has a whole breakfast menu starting at just 39 cents. Louise likes the warm caramel roll with a hot cup of coffee. You just drive through the takeout window and eat it on the way to work. We promise to love and honor, but not to always tell each other when we write a check or remember to deposit one. In the interest of domestic tranquility, Bank of America offers Quick Look, a mini statement, any time from any versatile machine. Quick Look, only with checking at Bank of America, because we'd much rather love and honor than interrogate. Bank of America.
I've been treating this seductive young woman. The psychiatrist. I had the dream again. His patient. I just can't seem to get off your couch, can I, Dr. Barr? Her sister. Do you always try to talk yourself out of what you want? The seduction. The setup. I think I'm married. I wish there was something we could do to help Heather. <laughs> the murder. Anyone see you? You're crazy. You think it was me? I didn't tell him anything. Richard Gere, Kim Basinger. Final analysis. Read it on. Starts Friday, February 7th at a theater near you. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Just who is John Burroughs? There are many clues and theories. The name John Burroughs first appeared on a letter Elvis Presley wrote to President Richard Nixon in 1970. Presley told the president that he was using the name John Burroughs as a pseudonym in order to avoid public scrutiny. Then, seven years after Elvis Presley supposedly died, John Burroughs' name suddenly reappears. Curiously, a few months before the Elvis Files aired, a gentleman in Kingman, Arizona named David Wasson held a workshop on Elvis and a class that led to a correspondence between Mr. Wasson and John Burroughs. We recently filmed an interview with David Wasson, and here is his story. In June of 1991, two months before the Elvis Files aired, a college teacher in Kingman, Arizona, David Wasson, hosted a four-day intensive workshop on the life of Elvis Presley and his contributions to American culture and the world of music. And some of the panel from our show participated in the workshop. In late August, after the Elvis Files was broadcast, Monty Nicholson contacted David and together they agreed that he write a letter to the address of Mr. John Burroughs. Now, David, could you give me a little background on the John Burroughs letter? After the, uh, the TV show last August, Monty received... The a, Elvis file. Right. Yeah. Monty received a, um, a tip that uh, John Burroughs, a name that Elvis at one time had gone by, was living in a certain state. And there was a connection between his name and Elvis Presley. And so we decided that I would write Mr. Burroughs a letter. Now, John Burroughs responded to your letter. Yes, he did. Uh, what did he write? I have a copy right here. Mm -hmm. He wrote, Dear Mr. Watson, I have received your letter and the info on Elvis. I'm sorry that I cannot meet you. I'm an entertainer, and I'll be out of state during that time. But I believe that you have a good idea on a living history on Elvis. Respectfully, John Burroughs. Now, what did you do when you, uh, when you received this letter? First thing I did, I grabbed my history books and looked up some samples of Elvis' handwriting, and I was quite impressed. This was very, very close. Yes, so am I. <laughs> well, what's your opinion now? Either there's someone out there who really has a lot of fun pretending he's Elvis Presley, uh -huh. has mastered the handwriting very well, or Elvis was very nice to send me a letter. Nice to send you a letter and then evaporate. Right. A lot of disappearances going on. Very few people get letters from Elvis today. So I'm they really feel pretty much. An awful lot of people see him, don't <laughs> they? They sure do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, when I saw the Watson letter for the first time, my first thought was, yes, that looks like Elvis Presley's handwriting. But the letter could easily have been traced from the authenticated Elvis Presley letter to President Nixon. We contact, contacted rather handwriting expert Sheila Lowe and had her make a scientific comparison of these two documents. And here is her conclusion. In my capacity as a question document examiner qualified by the California court systems, I was asked to compare a handwriting of Elvis Presley in a letter that he wrote to President Richard Nixon with a letter that contains the name John Burroughs. And during my examination, I compared the two samples of handwriting for the stroke quality, the writing impulse, degree of slant, and many other facets of handwriting. I also made overhead transparency so that I could make a direct comparison of the writing style. This is the letter to Richard Nixon. I'm going to show you the letter from John Burroughs and notice the word dear, mister, as I overlay this on top and you see how they match almost exactly. Both words, dear and mister. Also, the word John Burroughs, which this letter was signed, John Burroughs, was in 
this next letter to Richard Nixon. And as I overlay this, you'll see that these two are very, very similar. They have this, a space from the B to the rest of the word. The word John is written all in one impulse. The spacing between the two words is the same. And there are many, many similarities. The syntax in the two letters is also similar. Many of the same phrases and words were used. So what I did was to take the words that were the same in both letters and cut them out and paste them on a paper. And here they are for comparison. On this transparency, each of the top lines is the handwriting of Elvis, and the second line is the writing that was in the John Burroughs letter. The next thing that I did in my comparison was to prepare a psychogram chart on both handwritings. And the psychogram is a scientific instrument that was devised in the 1930s by a Dr. Clara Roman, who was a Hungarian psychiatrist. Here's the psychogram of Elvis Presley. And um, this is prepared by measuring over 40 different indicators in the handwriting. This is the psychogram of John Burroughs. And you'll see, as I lay one over the top of the other, that they are, again, almost identical. Having done this comparison, checking the slant, the size, the writing impulse, the stroke quality, and all of these other factors, I found that there are about 80% similarity between the two handwritings. But there's a 20% difference that is extremely important. And one of those differences is that in Elvis's writing, he consistently has what is called flame-shaped loops, which would be a loop that's pointed on the top, a feature that's missing in the John Burroughs letter. So in my professional opinion, having considered all these factors, I believe that the two handwritings were done by two different people. Elvis Presley didn't write this letter, then who did? Now, before he went to Fort Worth, Monty Nicholson called the phone number that he had managed to get for John Burroughs. All right, Monty, what happened when you called him? Well, I spoke to a man at the Burroughs residence. Uh, his name was Ron. He identified himself, uh, identified himself as a house guest. He gave a description of John Burroughs, which matched Elvis Presley's. Uh, this conversation took place on August 18, 1991, by the way. And John Burroughs was seen at the Winesburg Inn on August 23rd, just five days later. When we visited the address later, neither Ron nor John Burroughs were at home. Oh, well. Monty has spoken with people at John Burroughs' Fort Worth address on several occasions, and now we are going to call again. Monty, if you'd like to come over here. Hopefully we will disguise this tone so that we do not expose the telephone number nationally. I misdialed. I will start again. Live television. Hmm. I know this one is. At the sound of the beep, please leave your name and number, and we'll get right back with you. Thank you. Hi, this is a message for John Burroughs from Monty Nicholson. We are live on television. If you would like to comment on the Elvis conspiracy, please give us a call at 1-900-740-0401. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. Well, That's right. all right, since we're in the phone calls, we would like to take some from you at home. All right? Our first call, we have Tom from Philadelphia. Hello, Tom. Is it possible that Elvis Presley is actually disguised as Howard Stern? As Howard Stern? Yes. That's two shows in a row you're trying to get publicity for yourself. So we'll move to the next caller. Thank you. May we have a call from Dave in St. Louis. Hello, Dave. Steve in D.C. on uh, Q106.5 had mentioned one time that uh, Joe Esposito, and I'd like your opinion on this, was paid off handsomely as uh, 
were, I think, a couple other people. The nurse that actually uh, saw Elvis the night he was brought in, and one other person that, that uh, escapes my memory. I'd like your opinion on that. Do you know anything of this? We, we've investigated a lot of those uh, types of preposterous allegations, and there's really no merit to those allegations at all. All right. Charlie from Massachusetts. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Bill. Hi. First of all, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, qu Thank you. my question is this. Yeah. Uh, the name that Elvis supposedly recorded under, that uh, was supposed to be his name backwards, has anything been released under that name? And what was the name again? Hmm. I don't know that anything was released under that. We are going to deal with this issue later. Do you know, have any information with regard to that? There was nothing released that I'm aware of, but we are going to give information later so on. So perhaps you could call back or maybe it will, uh, you know, expose itself as we pursue this show. Now, throughout this program, we've tried to document all of the curious events that we discussed in our last broadcast. In the Elvis Files, we brought you the story of Kelly Burgess, a Detroit woman who claimed to have seen Elvis Presley in a Kalamazoo office building. Kelly Burgess has since passed away, but she was not alone that day, and we have managed to find the person with whom she shared this unsettling experience. When we come back, Jason Woolbright, Kelly's son, will tell us his first-hand version of the story, so stay with us. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, Elvis's closest friends and advisors present their side of the story and describe the Elvis you may never have known existed. Jergens just revolutionized its dry skin lotion from the inside out. Something this extraordinary won't stay bottled up for long. Reese's Crunchy Peanut Butter Cups have three times more peanuts. <laughs> have we gone too far? Not if you like peanuts. Reese's Crunchy Peanut Butter Cups, three times crunchier. The BBC, Turner Broadcasting and Time Life Video dare you to take a walk on the wild side with Trials of Life. The gripping, award-winning nature video series that exposes the struggle to survive through uncensored, shocking photography. Join acclaimed naturalist David Attenborough for a close encounter with raw nature. See the thrill of the hunt and the strategy of the kill. The relentless drive to continue the bloodline and the miracle of birth. Call now and receive hunting and escaping for $9.99 and see why the law of the jungle is kill or be killed. If it captures your interest, you can get other videos about every other month. Each tape explores the harsh realities of survival in the animal world. Take a walk on the wild side with Trials of Life. Call now to order hunting and escaping and find out why we call them animals. To order your Trials of Life, call 1-800-432-8800 or send $9.99 plus $3.23 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. With this ripe tomato, I'm going to show you how the new Aquafresh Flex Brush helps take care of your gums and your teeth. It has a flexible neck, so no matter how you brush, you can see it's gentle on your gums. New Aquafresh Flex for gentle dental care. Got great curves? Great curves deserve. 18 hour. Playtex 18 hour bronze. Supports full figures more beautifully. Comfortably. Great curves deserve. The 18 hour bra. From Playtex, the fit that makes the fashion. Start healing your dry skin from the inside. Out. Introducing Jergens Advanced Therapy Lotion. New Jergens goes beyond surface healing to actually heal dry skin from the inside. Out. Jergens penetrates to attract your body's inner moisture, healing your skin from the inside so it stays healthier looking outside. Heal your dry skin from the inside. Out. With new Jergens Advanced Therapy Lotions. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. Now, there have been many sightings of Elvis Presley reported all over the country, and we've seen there have been a series of encounters in Ohio, what Monty Nicholson calls the epicenter of Elvis sightings. Now, right now, we want to reinvestigate one of the stories we brought you in our first broadcast. Is 
Elvis Presley alive? Our third sighting took place in August of 1988 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kelly Burgess was intrigued with reports of Elvis sightings in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and in the summer of 1988, decided to investigate firsthand. Tipped off that John Burroughs, the mysterious owner of a local office building, resembled Elvis Presley, Kelly decided to go to the building and see for herself. Kelly has since passed away, but on a talk show, she described what she saw. I went into the offices, I went into four offices asking for Elvis Presley or John Burroughs. They all looked at me quite incredible. I mean, he's business people, and I'm asking for Elvis Presley. Kelly continued to check out the building until she was intercepted by security personnel and ushered into an office. And there, Kelly believes that she saw Elvis Presley. I turned around, and I looked directly into his eyes. He had on gold rim glasses a very modified version of what he used to wear. And they were with a slight tint to him. But I looked in his eyes, and he had the Elvis Presley expression in his eyes, which I think most people that knew him are familiar with. I mean, it's that, that kind of sparkle. The same, uh, same shape eyes, same color eyes. And I was, again, I was stunned. And I said, you have eyes just like Elvis. I said, are you a relative? He said, nope. Then, after he listened to, to my questions, just stood there, kind of, with a, a very pleasant look on his face, kind of half smiling at times. And just before I walked away, he said, yeah, but it's against the law to hoax your death. Now, as intriguing as Kelly's story was, we needed more verification. In order to find her son, we had to hire a private investigator, and it took time. But as you can see, we finally found Mr. Woolbright. Please welcome Jason Woolbright. All right, now, uh, Jason, did you see our first broadcast? Yes, I did. Well, I can't help but notice that in the recreation, we excluded you, and I assume that was our mistake. Yes, it was. I knew that. <laughs> but in lieu of that, how close was our depiction? It was very, very similar to the real thing. All right, in your own words, please, would you just tell us what happened that day? Sure. My mother had heard um, some information about Elvis being sighted in Kalamazoo. Yeah. And so the two of us decided to go down there and try to find out if there was any truth to that rumor. When we went there, we went to a local restaurant where we, we had heard that Elvis had been reported sighted there. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, one of the patrons had made a suggestion that their Elvis Presley had been sighted at a renovated office building. So they suggested that you go there? Is that the answer? Correct. And what happened? When we went there, my mother went inside the office building and started to talk to a few of the tenants. Mm -hmm. And while we were talking to one of the tenants, um, this man entered the, entered the room and then demanded that we leave the tenants alone and that he escorted us outside. All right. Do you think that you saw, at that time, Elvis Presley? I really can't say for certain. What did the man look like? He had, he had glasses on with uh, grayish hair and a beard, and he was wearing some jean overalls. All right, now tell us, how did it all end? All right, during the questioning, that Ma was, my mother was asking him some real uh, serious questions concerning the, the Elvis Presley death, and he was starting to become real rude with answering the questions by just saying, nodding his head or just saying yes or no. Mm -hmm. And then after that, my mother just uh, walked out of the building. And that was the end of that? That was it. Well, as intriguing as this sighting was, there are only memories to authenticate it, but there have been other alleged encounters with Elvis Presley that have been documented, phone calls, sightings, and even a recording session, and we'll tell you all about it when we return. First, let's check our public opinion poll, and remember, in our last show, 79% of those people polled believe that Elvis Presley could be alive. Now, let's see if that percentage has changed over the past few months. How many of our callers tonight think that Elvis Presley could be alive? Whoa. All right, so far, unchanged. We'll be back in a moment. Is Elvis Presley alive? Our fourth sighting took place in June of 1989 
near Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Carol Sheehan. On June 6, 1989, I saw Elvis Presley on a farm in Blount County, Alabama. Blount County is located northeast of Birmingham, Alabama. A rural area, it is an isolated location if someone wanted to disappear. Photographer Carol Sheehan was contacted by a friend who told her that Elvis Presley was in hiding on a local farm. Skeptical, Carol decided to see for herself. On June 6, 1989, I decided to take my son, Michael, out with me to the farm to find out exactly uh, for myself uh, if there really was Elvis uh, out there on the farm. I left Michael in the car with a two-way radio as my lookout, just in case uh, somebody came up that didn't want me there. I took my camera, went, snuck up on the farm, found some bushes to hide into, and uh, got all ready. And there was a guy uh, walking on the farm uh, that looked so much like Elvis. So I started shooting pictures. pulled up in a uh, car to talk with him for a while. Um, I managed to get one shot of that. Then Elvis turns and starts to walk towards my area, and I panicked, and I got back in my car and took off. Uh, when I got back home, uh, I had my pictures developed. I was more or less pleased with what I had. A check of local property records found no Elvis Presley or John Burroughs residing in the area. The only validation for Carol's story are these photographs. To some, they are enough. Could Elvis still be alive? Call 1-900-740-0410 from a touchtone phone anytime during our broadcast and give your opinion. Our poll will be updated during the course of our broadcast and selected callers will be able to ask questions of our panel. Calls are $2 per minute and callers under 18 need parental permission before calling. I know it's been quite a while. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, we'll attend a recording session where Elvis Presley allegedly cut a record four years after he supposedly passed away. Somehow, people have gotten the idea the new Toyota Paseo is a wildly exciting sporty coupe. The Paseo is a practical, sensible car. Okay, so it has some muscle. And a low starting price could be a big turn on. And sure, you're going to be instantly popular. That's no reason to do something impulsive. Think it over. The all-new Paseo. A very practical car. From Toyota. Both Visa and American Express Gold Cards can get you to La roche guillon one of the prettiest towns in France. But should something go wrong here, only Visa Gold can get you out. You had to come to France, right? Don't start, Martin. Because La roche guillons only towing service... No, we're not getting a tow truck. I can get this out. ...doesn't take American Express. Oui? Visa Gold, delivering what really matters. Jamal's wrong. Honey, that means I eat France. Oh. It's everywhere you want to be. What do you say? What do you say? Numbers are my life. Numbers never lie. I love them all. So when someone told me I can get a hamburger for 49 cents and a cheeseburger for 59 cents at Burger King, wow. And only Burger King gives me those great flame broiled burgers fixed any way I like them for terrific numbers like 49 cents and 59 cents. I get chills. It's so exciting. To me, it's a perfect 10. Your way right away, Burger King now. It's my birthday. But we're not doing anything special. We ordered dinner in. Jeff tried to make a cake. That's about all. Just an evening at home. Alone. Together. Um, one thing. He promised to wash my hair. Nexus. I love your hair. Only in salons. Tonight, Shannon Doherty, Diane Ladd, Louis Anderson, and Vlade Diva. Oh, to be a fly on the green room wall.
Welcome back to The Elvis Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Do you know who I am? Have you any idea who I am? I know it's been quite a while, and it's so good to see you again. Hi, the recording you've just heard has been presented as conclusive evidence that Elvis Presley did not die. And if the sound of the record isn't enough to convince you, listen to this. Wait a minute, man. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Wait a minute. Somebody. Somebody just told me that, uh, that, that President Reagan and, uh, and some other people I've been shot. I'd just like to, uh, I'd just like to say that, that I hope that, uh, I hope they're not hurt badly. Yes. Yes, there was an attempt made on President Reagan's life in March of 1981, four years after the alleged death of Elvis Presley. Now, some claim that this recording is proof that Elvis is alive. And the name of the singer is held up as further evidence. Civil Nora which is Elvis Aaron spelled backwards. Civil first appeared in 1981 and went way out of his way to maintain a low profile. A gentleman of the name by Stephen Chances was in contact with Civil Nora, and in 1981, responding to fan club pressure, Chances released a home video where the mysterious Civil actually appears and even sings. We have obtained a copy of this videotape, now, in order to protect Mr. Chance's privacy, we've obscured his face. Now, let's watch it. You can't please everybody all time, and if it makes people happy to hear my voice and to know I'm living, then, then that makes me happy. Make sure I can just sing in tune. If you think I don't need you, my eyes, where there's any raindrops, I'm falling out of the sky, I've seen a few things gone, I've seen the same song, if you think I don't need you, baby you're wrong, if you think I don't love you, oh baby what can I do, and to prove to you baby, my love is true. All right, I am curious, after watching that tape, how many of you in the audience believe that Sybil is really Elvis? May I see a show of hands, please? All right, interesting. Now, let's get back to the recording we heard earlier, where Sybil stops the song and says that somebody just told them that President Reagan has been shot. I mean, it's just too convenient, let's assume for a moment, that Sybil is a hoax. Someone is trying to convince people that it really is Elvis Presley. Blurting out a reference about President Reagan is a pretty obvious way to imply Elvis is still alive. Still, there is little doubt, at least to the human ear, Civil Nora sounds very much like Elvis Presley. But there is a way that we might be able to determine whether or not Elvis is making these tapes. Now first, let's listen to this. Dear Mr. President, first I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Elvis Presley. I admire you and have great respect for your office. I'm sitting at the Washington Hotel. I'm using under the name of John Burroughs. I will be here as long as it takes to get the credentials of a federal agent. Respectfully, Elvis Presley. All right, did it fool you? Well, Johnny Hera would fool just about anybody, but he would be hard-pressed to fool a voice print, so he decided to run a voice print test on the 1981 mystery tape. But before we show you the results of that test, I'd like to introduce you to our Elvis impersonator, Mr. Johnny Hera, please. <laughs> well, well, good, to see, good to see you too, John. All right, Johnny, welcome. Now, how long, how long have you been working as an Elvis impersonator? Since I was 11 years old. And how many years have you been doing it? About 35 years now. About 35 years. 
35 years. Yes, sir. Well, looking at you, it's obvious that people could mistake you for Elvis. So have any of the Elvis sightings that you're aware of actually been you? Um, <clears throat> no, sir. The, um, I was mistaken for Elvis in, in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. I was on the, on the front page of the, of the Rocky Morning News um, in 1976. And the other time was here in, in Las Vegas when I was uh, with one of my doctors here. No, uh, one? With one of, the, one of the doctors here. <laughs> yeah, one of the doctors. It was Elvis's doctor, if I remember correctly, um, that you, yes, were, you were seen with. Now, yes, that, a, that appeared in the papers? Uh, yes, sir. Did one of the tabloids. Uh, All right. I, I heard it, yes, sir. Let me ask you. Do you think that there's a possibility that Elvis Presley could still be alive? Well, very sad for, for the fans and sad for... For myself, uh, no, sir, I don't, I don't think he's with us. All right, Johnny. Thank you very much for contributing this evening. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. Johnny Hara. Thank you, Johnny. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we took the 1981 mystery tape to an audio analysis lab at the University of California at Los Angeles. We also gave the analyst, Dr. Peter Ladefoge, a known example of Elvis Presley's voice recorded at a press conference in 1970. This is what he discovered when he compared these two recordings. Well, the first step in comparing two voices is to get tape recordings of a known and an unknown voice. Uh, here's a tape recording of the known voice of Elvis Presley taken from a press conference. And here are all the question tapes that we've been worrying about as to whether they are real or not. Uh, I want to go through them and find words that are the same on both. So I'm going to start with the Elvis Presley tape, put that Elvis Presley tape in, and we can play that back, and you'll hear part of this press conference. Uh, this is Elvis saying, you see, country music is always a part of, and this word always I'm particularly interested in. I happen to have got the word always as said by the unknown speaker, uh, also recorded. And in fact, I cut out those two pieces of always from the two speakers and put them onto a computer. And now let's play them back from the computer. First, the always out of that piece you've just heard, and immediately following it, the always uh, from the mystery tape. There we go. Uh, Elvis, and then the mystery tape. And as you can see, they're forming patterns on the screen. Uh, and it's those patterns that I want to be able to examine. Here are the words always, as said by Elvis Presley, the known voice. And here is an always from one of the tapes, which might or might not be Elvis Presley. You can see that there's a great deal of similarity. The patterns are the same in some senses here and there. This word is a bit more drawled out and a bit longer. But to me, there are noticeable differences. Typically, the higher up pieces up here uh, in the unknown voice don't match those uh, of the known voice of Elvis Presley. There are also small differences in the way in which the curvature of these bars showing the frequencies in his voice change from the real voice to the unknown voice, and they're all in slightly different positions. When I consider these tapes, I don't think any of them are Elvis Presley. If we think about that uh, voice on the mystery tape, that doesn't seem to be Elvis Presley, almost certainly. So all in all, all these voices strike me as very unlikely to be Elvis Presley. If Elvis Presley did not make this recording, then who did, and why? Dr. Ladefoge believes, based on his scientific analysis, the voice of the 1981 mystery tape is not that of Elvis Presley. Science can also help us in another part of our investigation. When we come back, we're going to see for ourselves what Elvis Presley might look like today. A description that bears an uncanny resemblance to the mysterious John Burroughs. So hang in there. Elvis conspiracy is finally revealed. Could John Burroughs really be Elvis Presley?
My mother would have a fit if she thought I wasn't using a detergent and a fabric softener for my dirtiest clothes. But why mess with these things when Ultra Bold does the job of both? It's the only concentrated detergent and softener in one. See? Super clean and super soft. With Ultra Bold, I don't need a detergent and a softener. I just keep them around in case Mom drops by, which is always right about... Ultra Bold. Clean, soft, and simple. Mom, what a surprise. An afternoon of playing grandparent can take quite a lot out of you. Magnesium, for example. Vitamin B6, vitamin C, and valuable potassium. As nature would have it, replacing all of them is as simple as eating one Chiquita banana. In the case of twins, however, you might want to try two. Chiquita, quite possibly the world's perfect food. I do. Love the taste? I do. I do. Cinnamon, fresh mint. I do. I do. I do. I do. Sugar-free Trident. The one gum more dentists recommend actually tastes great, too. Who wants Trident? I do. I do. Who? Cheetahs. Who wants Trident? We do. We do. I do. I do. Good for your teeth. Great taste, too. Who wants my mother's earrings, her scarf, but my mother's tampons. No way! I found new Ultimates, cardboard applicator tampons from Playtex. Great protection, plus a curved cardboard applicator. Ultimates, it's not your mother's tampon. I won't wear anything without Cross Your Heart, because Cross Your Heart has crisscross shaping, so I always look better whatever I wear. Playtex Cross Your Heart bra. Don't wear anything without Cross Your Heart from Playtex, the fit that makes the fashion. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. Now, we have met people who are convinced that they did see Elvis Presley. If Elvis were alive today, he would be 57 years old. What would he look like? We decided to find out. We contacted Eugene O'Donnell, a graphic computer specialist who works for the FBI. Mr. O'Donnell helped develop a computer program that can take the common characteristics of aging and superimpose that process on existing features. He agreed to help us, and we supplied him with a photograph of Elvis as a young man. It took Mr. O'Donnell 16 hours of computer time to come up with the following composite. In this case, O'Donnell took a photograph of Elvis Presley as a young man and slowly aged him to the 57 years he would be today. Now, obviously, this enhancement doesn't take into account weight or surgical alteration. But O'Donnell's computer program can also anticipate hairstyles. For example, if Elvis Presley did indeed grow a beard, this is what he might look like. This is as close to a picture of the 57-year-old Elvis Presley as it is possible to get with computer enhancement. Now, throughout the program, we've been bringing you first-hand stories of Elvis sightings, and along with that, we've also described the mysterious events centering on a man known as John Burroughs. In a few minutes, we're going to take your phone calls, but first, let's take a look at our electronic map. So far, we have shown you four different sightings of a man resembling Elvis Presley. One was in Clyde, Ohio, at the Winesburg Inn. One was on a farm in Blunt County, Alabama. And two were in Michigan, in an office building in Kalamazoo and a bar in Grand Blanc. These are our four documented Elvis signings. Now, we're not saying that these people actually saw Elvis Presley, but we feel it's safe to say they saw someone matching his description. Now, we've also followed John Burroughs around the country through the credit report paper trail. Where Mr. Burroughs goes, Elvis sightings seem to follow. Our witnesses describe the man they saw as in his mid-50s, between 6 feet and 6 feet 2 inches in height, overweight, with graying dark hair. Some have reported that he has sideburns, others a beard. Again, there seems to be a pattern. In a number of places where people claim they have seen a man they believe to be Elvis Presley, a person by the name of John Burroughs has also been tracked. Just what is going on here? All right. 
Now, please forgive me, Monty, but I'm still a little confused. Does the, do the dates, rather, of the four Elvis sightings coincide at any point with the dates found along the John Burroughs paper trail? Oh, they certainly do. In every instance where an Elvis sighting was reported, there was also a request for credit history of John Burroughs. All right, I think I understand. Let's see if there's any questions from our viewers at home. Hello, we have a call from Tracy from Nashville. Hi, Tracy. Hello, Bill. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to tell y'all, back in 1990, I worked for a local police department. I was a dispatcher. And um, just by curiosity, I had ran Elvis Presley's name across the computer, which gives you his uh, driver's license number. Uh -huh. And I ran his driver's license number, and his driver's license came up valid. And if it is valid, I mean, if he's dead, then how come it's valid? All right. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Uh, now we have Carol Ann from Michigan, please. Hello, Carol Ann. Hello. Hi. Um, my question is that if Elvis has gone to such lengths to I'm hide, sorry. if Elvis yes. has gone to such lengths to hide his identity, why not leave the identity where it is now? Why do this? I think it's been provoked, really. Simply because of the sightings, it keeps going on and on in the press, and it keeps coming up and up, and it would be a nice thing to solve. I think that's why it's going on, and hopefully it will end this evening. That would be very nice, too. We have Carleen from Brooklyn. Hello, Carleen. Hello, Bill. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I have a question for Monty? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I also have one for you, if it's all right. You worked with Elvis. Yes. Do you think Elvis is stupid? Do I think Elvis was stupid? Right. No, I certainly don't. We had a wonderful time together. And uh, all I can tell you is the man had tremendous instincts. But stupid? No, he wasn't stupid. He was one of the most curious minds that I have ever known. You'll hear about that later, too. So what are we down to? That Elvis is alive and being seen all around the Midwest, or that Elvis is dead, and someone is staging these sightings to perpetuate a hoax for their own personal benefit. When we come back, we're going to talk with someone who should be able to throw some light on this curious chain of events, and that man is Joe Esposito, Elvis Presley's Army buddy, Chief of Staff, and Confidence. So please stay with us. Could Elvis still be alive? Call 1-900-740-0410 from a touchtone phone anytime during our broadcast and give your opinion. Our poll will be updated during the course of our broadcast, and selected callers will be able to ask questions of our panel. Calls are $2 per minute, and callers under 18 need parental permission before calling. When the Elvis conspiracy continues, you'll have a chance to talk with Elvis's right-hand man, who is finally going to tell all he knows about the mysterious events of August 16, 1977. Tonight on Miller, a couple of chairs, a mic, and a kid with a dream. They're going to ban breast implants for women, declare a moratorium on Porsche sales for men. Joining Dennis is Louie Anderson. People make those kind of comments all the time, don't they? Today, Wednesday? All day. Also tonight, Mr. Miller welcomes actress Shannon Doherty, Diane Ladd, and L.A. Laker, Bonnie D. Back. Tonight, on the Dennis Miller Show. Now's the time. Get up, get out of your chair, off your couch, grab your loved one, hop in your car, get to McDonald's. You know the place. Smiling faces in those golden arches you love so much. Just get here. We don't care how you do it. Planes, trains, tricycles, crawl if you have to, but get here now. I mean right now. Time is running out. Tick tock, tick tock. Because right now, for a limited time at participating McDonald's, you can get mighty wings. You'll get five or ten great tasting. I mean really big, meaty, crispy, crunchy, tantalizing. Boy, are they good. They're better than good tender and juicy chicken wing sections. You can hand dip in a special hot sauce. Ooh, yummy. Hurry, but wait till this commercial's over. Okay, go. You can store all this at public storage and pay just one dollar for the first month's rent. You can store all this at public storage and still pay just one dollar for the first month's rent. You can even store all this at public storage and pay just one dollar for the first month's rent. Call public storage. You store it, you lock it, you keep the key. Remember when Detroit was Motor City? The best cars were made in the USA. Everybody had a V8. Cars had muscles. You know, but they weren't very smart, like uh, eight miles to the gallon. 
muscles her back, and Ford got him. This is the five-liter V8 Thunderbird, a big, bad car with good mileage. For 90s, you can have it all. Muscles, looks, and brains. Used to be a bank here. One day it was in business, next day it was gone. Well, if your bank is calling it quits and you're wondering what to do, switch to Great Western Bank. You'll find a 24-hour hotline, Saturday hours, all the conveniences. And right now, you'll even get free checking. So, if your bank's history, come to Great Western. They're still making history. And they're nice people, too. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy, brought to you from the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Now, before we meet our next guest, let's update our phone poll. How many of our United States callers believe that Elvis Presley could be alive? 75-25. All right, very interesting. Joining us now is a man who should know more about Elvis Presley's state of mind in August of 1977 than anyone else. Joe Esposito. Joe, Joe. Now, Joe is Elvis's right-hand man, chief of staff, and confidant. Joe is currently writing his own book on his 17 years with Elvis Presley. It's called Elvis and the Memphis Mafia, and it'll be coming out pretty soon. Joe, welcome. Now, you have heard what we said to this point. Who is John Burroughs, and what do you think is going on? Well, John Burroughs, to me, is just somebody that somebody made up this. Uh, it's like a big hoax. They knew Elvis's alias was John Burroughs, and uh, I think somebody's doing this for their own game. All right, Joe, but we have a we have a 75 percent percentage of people here who believe that Elvis is still alive. So, what would you say to that? Well, I mean, Elvis Presley is dead. He died on August 16, 1977. I'm sorry to say, I was there, and uh, that's all I can say. Did Elvis ever discuss a um, secret FBI? Sting operation with you? No, the first time I heard about that was on the show that you guys did a few, you know, last year. Uh, no, I never heard of any operation like that. All right, now, to the best of your knowledge, was Elvis Presley ever an undercover agent for, agent rather, for any law enforcement agency? No, uh, Elvis loved to be in law enforcement, but he was definitely not an agent for any law enforcement agency. All right, there are questions that I have from our first broadcast. Uh, as Elvis's road manager, You'd be in a position to know the answer to several of these questions. It was stated that there was an undercover agent in Elvis's band. Is that true? Well, as far as his immediate band, his rhythm section, no. I knew all those musicians for many years. They were definitely not undercover agents. But he had an orchestra that traveled with him. Now, it's possible that there was one in that group, but for what reason? There's no reason to have an undercover agent. They never traveled with us anyhow. But there'd be none in the immediate group. No, sure. absolutely not. All right. Now, some people have maintained that Elvis Presley flew out by helicopter uh, when he, uh, let's see, he flew out by helicopter into hiding when he allegedly died. Do you remember seeing a helicopter that day? Only after his announcement of his death, Bill. Uh, there was no helicopters flying over Graceland before that. Uh, there was all the press after it was announced that he was dead. But then when it was announced that... Helicopters helicopter. everywhere, yeah. All right, Joe. Uh, now, your version of events puts an end to any speculation that Elvis Presley might still be alive. And earlier you said that you'd be willing to take questions from our viewers at home. That's what I'm here for. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you, please, to be brief and stay on the subject, please. Our first phone call is Harold from somewhere, because I haven't been able to read that, from St. Louis. Hello, Harold. Yes, sir. Mr. Bix. My yes. question is to you, if Elvis is still alive, whose body did they haul out of Graceland? Was it the maid or the butler? Good question. <laughs> good question. <laughs> A good question. Good question. <laughs> I, I have no idea whose body, if it was in fact a real body, which was implied uh, from our first show that that may not have been. We have David from North Carolina. Hello, David. Hey, how are you doing, Mr. Big? Fine, thank you. Uh, my question to you is, uh, are you doing uh, this to prepare the world that Elvis is still alive so <laughs> the world wouldn't be sh such a shock that when Elvis does uh, surface and come back? No, no, actually we're not. It was. That was suggested on our first show, that uh, this was to prepare the way for Elvis. But there's no intention on our behalf to try that. 
Uh, it just simply is we're trying to track down and get rid of, um, you know, rumors. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, Becky from Houston. Hello, Becky. You know, it's an honor to talk to you. And uh, I've read where David Dardock is the one that is uh, on the tape impersonating uh, Elvis Presley. And I wish to just let him rest in peace. Yes, uh, I did a show uh, on Geraldo's show, uh, and he was on that show, and he is the one that stated he did that tape, and he had a contract from the fan club that paid him $250 to make that tape just for them, and that is the voice on that tape. All right, Michelle from New York, please. Hello, Michelle. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Okay, my question is, um, I heard that Lisa Marie disappears two months out of every year, and nobody knows where she goes. Is it true, and does she go to see him? Joe? Well, uh, I haven't heard of that story. I don't know where you heard that one either, but uh, I don't think that's true because uh, where is she going to go for those two months? Elvis is not here anymore. All right. Now, Joe, we have some people, rather, have charged that your version of the official story has changed over the years. There's ne there never been an official story by me. Uh, I've given many interviews to many reporters, and what they interpret, I cannot tell you. It comes out different every time. All right. When we come back, our studio audience will have some questions for you, Joe, so please don't you go away, and don't you go away. I'll be here. So will I. When we come back, Joe Esposito will answer your questions on the controversy that won't go away. Is Elvis still alive? If you love chocolate bars, you better grab a spoon. You see, Hershey's turned your favorite chocolate bar flavors into delicious pudding. Come on. With 70% skim milk in every spoonful. Hershey puddings. Chocolate bar flavors you can eat with a spoon. You're right. Starting them off with hot Quaker oatmeal is the right thing to do. It's the right thing for you, too, you know. You can stand the warming <laughs> and the nourishment. Mm, instant Quaker oatmeal. It's the right thing to do. Shower yourself with a new sensation. New refreshing Shield. Feel the blast. The high energy beat of Shield's unique skin invigorating formula. Refreshment that'll turn you around. New refreshing Shield. A puzzle. With so many stomach remedies around, how do you know which you can take for heartburn? And for diarrhea? And for upset stomach. You take Pepto-Bismol to relieve most any common stomach problem. Heartburn, upset stomach, and diarrhea. So who needs anything else? That is a puzzle. Pepto-Bismol is the only one you need. Got great curves? Great curves deserve. 18 hour. Paytex 18 hour bra. Supports full figures more beautifully. Comfortably. Great curves deserve. From Playtex, the fit that makes the fashion. I had this doozy of a sore throat. You know what my doc suggested? Chloroseptic. I actually felt the pain go away in seconds. Because Chloroseptic penetrates on contact for fastest relief. More doctors say Chloroseptic spray. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. All right, Joe, we appreciate you staying with us. Let me ask, please, why do you think people keep reporting that Elvis is alive? Well, because I think Elvis was loved by millions and millions of people, and, uh, and these people that are causing this hoax know that, and uh, to me it gives a lot of false hope to them, and I hope uh, we can straighten this out on the show. Well, in the summer of 1990, you appeared on another television show, and in a conversation about Elvis's biographer, Albert Goldman, you said, and I quote, uh, and that's how Elvis feels about the situation, the present tense. Why the present tense? Well, I probably said it in the present tense because I feel Elvis is with me all the time. Elvis is alive in my heart and he'll be there forever. And hope it is for everybody, too. All right. All right. I'm, I'm sure that many people here in the audience have some questions. Please, have we a question? Sir. Yes. Madam. Hi. My name's Wanda. I'm from Ohio, and I have a question that maybe you can put to rest. Elvis's daughter, Lisa, 
someone said or I had read that she was to inherit uh, the main estate when she turned 21 or whatever the age was. 25. But, or 25, but that has since been changed to 30. Right. Is that correct? Yes, and it has. why would that change if... Because that's what Lisa wanted. She did not want to take the responsibility at the time when she turned 25, and she'd rather push it back to 30, and that's the way so she So this wanted. was at her own request? That was her own idea, yes. All right. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, sir? Yeah, hi. My name is Chris um, from L.A. in Vegas. Um, I was wondering, do you think the obsession with the death of Elvis is kind of significant of what... Could you get closer to the mic, please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The, the obsession with the death of Elvis is characteristic of like the state of rock and roll at the moment. Um, I mean, I generally feel that Elvis wanted to listen to the music instead of all this, this constant going on about is he alive or not. Do you think um, this is a common trend, or do you, what are your comments on that? All right. Well, I just feel that, like I said earlier, Elvis is loved by so many people that hate to see him leave, and uh, that people keep bringing up the thing for their own gain. I have an idea who it is who's causing this hoax, but I can't say the name. But uh, I just want to make sure that Elvis, I mean, Elvis is not here, I'm sorry to say, he's gone, he died. People have to understand that, physically. Yes, what you're saying, he died. Yes. Hi, my name is Amy and I'm from McHenry, Illinois. Could you speak up just a little, please? My name is Amy and I'm Hi. from McHenry, Illinois. And my question is, is it true that Elvis's dead body weighed less than when he was alive? Well, uh, that, I, I, can't, I can't answer that, I wish I could, I, I don't know what, uh, how that works. Uh, I, he was heavy, yes, when he died, but I don't know what he weighed. All right. Yes, please. Joe, you know Elvis had a twin brother that died at birth, and I was wondering, is there any possibility that that brother could be alive? No, that's another whole story now. I mean, <laughs> no, he died at birth, ma'am. I'm sorry. It was at birth. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't don't start that rumor, please. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I can smell that one. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to know, uh, given the state of Elvis' health back in 1976, if he hadn't died, do you think he could have lived another 15 years? Good question. Well, uh, as far as being around Elvis and knowing how strong he was, I al we thought Elvis would live forever, and uh, it was not true. Uh, uh, but, uh, yes, at that time I would say he probably lived on, but it, it happened so quick we didn't expect it. Yes. Hello. Being an Elvis fan, I'd like to believe that he was still alive, but I personally don't believe that. And I hope that the fans will listen to this. Um, Elvis was a man that had a lot of dignity, and if he was to hope his own death, I don't think he wants to he have shown all the drugs found in his body at the time of death. Thank you. Very true. Thank you. Yes. We have a question. I, do I have a question here? No, I don't have a question. Do I have a question over here? Does anyone have a question? I'll tell you a question. I'll tell you what I have a question for you, Joe. What do you think Elvis would have made of this entire situation? Well, Elvis is probably up in heaven, I hope, at the time, laughing at all this. Uh, I think it's a big joke. But then I think at other times he'd probably be very upset because it gives hope to people that got to realize, let him rest. Let him rest in peace. He's gone. Yes. Now, like so many curious events surrounding the death of Elvis Presley, it all comes down to believers versus non-believers. But through all of these theories, something often gets left out. The kind of person that Elvis Presley really was. Was he the kind of person who could have done what some say he's done? Let's say for a moment, Elvis did fake his own death. He's changed his name, he's living a furtive lifestyle on the run, and yet... He's finding the time to make phone calls, make records, and appear in some very unusual places. Could this man be Elvis Presley? When we come back, we're going to talk with someone who knew one side of Elvis better than anyone, and he believes he knows the answer. Joe, thank you very much for being here, and you stay with us. Thank you, Joe. Could Elvis still be alive? Call 1-900-740-0410 from a touchtone phone anytime during our broadcast and give your opinion. Our poll will be updated during the course of our broadcast and selected callers will be able to ask questions of our panel. Calls are $2 per minute and callers under 18 need parental permission before calling. Who was the real Elvis Presley? One man knows. His closest friend and spiritual advisor, Larry Geller. 
When we come back, for the first time on television, Larry tells the real story of the king of rock and roll. How's that? Great! I like you, Sebastian. You got it. I always tell my customers, be sure to take your credit card receipts. I should have listened to myself. Whoa. Citibank for me? The other day I got a call from Citibank. Hello? Seems somebody charged some pretty fancy stuff on my card number. Citibank suspected fraud, but they said I wouldn't be responsible for the charges. I've seen Citibank look out for my customers. Seems they're also looking out for me. Not just Visa, Citibank Visa. Miller Lite salutes California's Olympic hopefuls. West Hills' Ellen Breen's march to a medal in freestyle skiing was slowed by a knee injury. With treatment, she hopes to be ready for Albertville. Ever since I was a kid, I was like, God, that would be a great dream to come true. So I'm knocking on wood, hoping that uh, with my knee coming back strong, um, it'll, it'll still come true. Ellen Breen, a California Olympic hopeful. This Albertville update has been brought to you by Miller Lite. That's it, and that's that. <laughs> Nothing beats it. You want the bar across the street. <laughs> Wait, man, that's left Miller. It's everything you want up here to be. Universal Studios Hollywood and Channel 5 celebrate the movie. You can win tickets to an Academy Awards night party. Send us your name and address on a postcard that says KTLA is LA's movie station and you'll automatically be entered into our drawing. Five grand prize winners receive the Academy Awards party package featuring a JVC camcorder. Their cassettes play on any VHS VCR, hotel accommodations, and Hertz car rental. Celebrate the movies with Universal Studios Hollywood and Channel 5, LA's movie station. Tonight on Miller, a couple of chairs, a mic, and a kid with a dream. They're going to ban breast implants for women, declare a moratorium on Porsche sales for men. Joining Dennis is Louie Anderson. People make those kind of comments all the time, don't they? Today, Wednesday? All day. Also tonight, Mr. Miller welcomes actress Shannon Doherty, Diane Ladd, and L.A. Laker, Buddy D. Back. Tonight on the Dennis Miller Show. Palace Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. With all of the controversy swirling around his life and his death, it's easy to lose sight of the private Elvis Presley. His life has been the subject of countless books and, and, and studies, but most of these works suffer from one thing. They don't reflect the real Elvis. The Elvis, his closest friends, and his family's members really knew. In 1964, our next guest started out working for Elvis in a humble capacity, his hairdresser. But soon Larry Geller became much more than that. He became a major influence on Elvis's life and was with him until 1977. And this is Larry's story. No, let's see, I met Elvis in February of 67. Now that goes pretty far back. Yeah. But you go considerably farther back. Yes, I, here's, here, here's how it started. I, Elvis invited me up to his house in Bel Air, 1964, early 1964, in April. Big house, too, I remember. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right over the golf course. Yes. And he was just finishing a film called Ralph's About, mm -hmm. and he wanted me to style his hair, which I did, which led into a five-hour conversation about the meaning, the purpose of life. Elvis told me his life story. He told me about his mother. He, he cried. We got into so many areas. So many intimate areas. That's it was just a night. natural, you just we, fell naturally we, in. We just clicked. It yeah. was just something that happened. And that night changed both of our lives. He said, you know, Larry, listening to you talk, I, I always know, I've always known my whole life there was an unseen hand guiding my life. 
But Doc, why, Doc, he went, he, he made this motion with his hand. He said, why was I plucked out of millions and millions of lives to be Elvis Presley? Why me? There's got to be a reason. So when he said that, I said, Elvis, I know some books. If you really want to get into this now, I know some books. Yeah. If you're willing to read, he said, willing to read? Yeah, man, listen, you got to work for me. Our lives changed that night. Because over the years, I gave him hundreds of books. From 1964 to 1977, Larry Geller and the books rarely left Elvis' side. Larry was with Elvis all the way until the end, and remembers that despite health problems, Elvis Presley never lost his love of the spotlight. The point is, Elvis was plagued with physical ailments. He was a man, he was a man that was dying. He didn't want to die, but he was dying slowly. His last performance was in June, June 26, 1977, about seven weeks before he died. And he was so ill, he knew how he looked. In fact, he said that night, he said, I know what people must think, but I tell you, I'm going to look at my coffin. Are we talking omen here? It was a definite omen, there's no doubt about it, but you know, when someone says something like that, and I suspected it, something in me knew that that was quite possible. It was dismissed. It was something that Elvis said. But he loved to perform. Bill, it was his, he said, Lisa Marie, my daughter, is the joy of my life. But performing, if you could only experience the joy, the rush of energy that I get on that stage, it's beyond anything I've ever experienced before. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Geller. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good to be here. Thank you. All right, welcome, please, Larry. You, you, you were among the few people allowed to remain by Elvis when he was in his casket. Yes. In fact, you, you actually uh, you dressed him for the funeral, and you even dyed his hair black. Uh, at the risk of uh, seeming indelicate, was that really Elvis? Bill? As long as I live, I'll never forget August 16th, 1977. Because that's the day I was died. And something deep inside of me just froze. It's like time stood still, and it's still with me. Elvis's father, Vernon, asked me to please go to the mortuary to work on Elvis's hair, prepare him for the funeral. So the next morning, very early, Charlie Hodge, who worked for Elvis, and myself walked into the room at the mortuary and there was Elvis, lying on a table, with a sheet covered right up, right up to right there. Yes. It was, it was overwhelming to, to look at him. And I noticed right away, they, they, see Elvis really had white hair, mm -hmm. and I dyed it black every three or four weeks. He had a regrowth of about an inch to an inch and a half of white hair all over, his sideburns all over his hair. I wasn't prepared for it. So very quickly, there was a female attendant, and I asked her if she had any mascara. Yeah. Fortunately, she had black mascara. So I took that little brush out, and I blended it into his hair. It was hair mine. Yeah. Made it look as natural as possible, proceeded to work on his hair, and to top everything off, the two other attendants that were getting him ready removed the sheet, entiring, uh, exposing his entire body. He's laying there with incision marks from the autopsy crisscrossing his torso. Bill, you know me. I have worked on Elvis for over 14 years, thousands of times. If you only knew how much I wish he was with us right here, right now. I know you do. But that was Elvis. That was Elvis. All right, let me ask you something. Uh, how seriously, I'm just changing the subject for a moment. Okay. How seriously did Elvis take law enforcement? The FBI, bomb squad, local police, his own security force, which was a real good one, mm -hmm. protected his life, our life, his family's life, the fans' life. Mm -hmm. He had a deep admiration, a deep respect, 
And so he collected badges. He was a marshal. Out of respect for law enforcement. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In a very major way, because he knew the importance. And you were saying that he, he I'm sorry, I interrupted you. He was collecting well, badges. Well, he, he collected badges. Uh, he was an honorary marshal. He was an honorary sheriff, DEA agent. Mm -hmm. He was an honorary uh, police commissioner. But he was honorary. That's it. End of story. Yeah. Now, why do you think so many people believe that Elvis is still alive? Elvis is the biggest star that ever happened. He, th there'll never be another Elvis. He made such an impact on people's lives his energy is still rippling around this planet it's going to go on and it will never stop and to, to really understand this phenomenon we have to understand that in a spiritual sense he's still alive what do you mean by the spiritual sense Michael Landon John F Kennedy Martin Luther King, you, me, everyone that's listening to us right now, they're going to go through that doorway of death. Death is not the end. It's a doorway to a new beginning, to, to, the, to the natural eternalness of our soul. That's what life is all about. This is the, this is the fact of existence. Elvis went through that door. He didn't die, he went through the door. He went on, Elvis went on, just like we're all gonna go on. So in a very special sense, Elvis lives on in his music, in his films, in our memories, but most importantly, the connection is in our heart. Elvis is still with us. All right, at the beginning of this broadcast, we said that we'd have some answers for you about whether or not Elvis Presley is alive. And it all comes down to who and what you believe. For a believer, there isn't any explanation required. And for the skeptic, there isn't any explanation possible. We'll be right back. The Elvis Conspiracy will be back in a moment. The Elvis Conspiracy is sponsored in part by Jif. For more fresh roasted peanut taste and aroma, choosy moms choose Jif. <laughs> we got the best books in the library. All right. Picked up some books for Billy, too. Great choices. And then we went shopping. Cindy, what's that? Peanut butter. I mean, you spend all morning choosing the perfect children's books and then settle for that brand. Hey, I grew up on this. Try my Jif. What's the difference? Oh, smell yours. Smells okay. Now my Jif. Mmm, smells more like fresh roasted peanuts. Yeah, now taste Jif. Mmm, wow, Jif tastes more like fresh peanuts. Like right out of the roaster. We've got a new peanut butter. Mmm. Right, Troy? Hey, you just wrote the book on peanut butter. Oh, clever. <laughs> For more fresh roasted peanut taste, choosy moms choose Jif. No, you go ahead, honey. My throat really hurts. When your throat is sore and it's feeling raw, Sucrets wraps your throat in soothing relief. Much better. Only Sucrets has Diclinine for long-lasting relief. Sucrets wraps your throat in soothing relief. It's good. It's real good. It's home cooking soup. Not hot enough. No? Well, better let me check. Gee, I'd say perfect. Charlie, what, what do you say? Celery and carrots are mighty good. Well, Stan, how about you? Chicken's delicious. Noodles, too. Golly, Fred, looks like you've got nothing to complain about. Gee, guys, thanks for nothing. Don't mention it. Our pleasure. The name is home cooking, and so is the taste. From Campbell's. I hate cleaning twice. Spray cleaner for grease, then glass cleaner for the streaks of spray left. Don't clean it twice. Cinch it once. New Cinch from Spick and Span. It's the first cleaner that really cleans grease, even on glass, without streaking. Glass cleaner can't always get the grease, and spray cleaners can leave streaks. Either way, you'd have to clean twice. But New Cinch gets the grease and the streaks, even on glass. Don't clean it twice, cinch it once. I'll borrow my mother's earrings, her scarf, but my mother's tampons. No way! I found new Ultimate cardboard applicator tampons from Playtex. Great protection, plus a curved cardboard applicator. Ultimate. 
It's not your mother's tampon. Start healing your dry skin from the inside out with Jergens Advanced Therapy Lotion. Jergens penetrates to attract your body's inner moisture, so it heals dryness from the inside out. Introduce your skin to Jergens. Welcome back to the Elvis Conspiracy. Throughout the course of this broadcast, we've been conducting a phone poll, logging callers from around the United States on whether or not they believe Elvis Presley could still be alive. Now let's see our final tally. Seventy thirty. It has changed a little, but not that much. Now I'm curious, after all that you've seen this evening, how many of you in our audience think that Elvis Presley could still be alive. May I see some hands? And those that believe he has passed on? All right, thank you. Now, last August, when I first appeared before you, I mentioned the importance of having an open mind. And through these two broadcasts, I've tried to keep an open mind myself. But in my personal opinion, I believe, sadly, that Elvis did pass away on August 16th, 1977. I also believe that in a very special, sublime sense, Elvis Presley will never die, and he'll be alive as long as people love him and cherish his memory. I'm Bill Bixby, and thank you very much.
Illinois residents add eight and a half percent sales tax. If you would like to order the Presley arrangement at twelve ninety five or Elvis Calling at nineteen ninety five by Monty Nicholson, please call this number now one eight hundred four three five one one three one or take advantage of our special offer. Both books for twenty nine ninety five. Shipping and handling included in the above prices. California residents add eight and a quarter percent sales tax.